Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Woodville this beautiful morning. Why don't you stand to your feet? You guys excited to be here this morning? Come on. Let's give God all we got this morning, church. Worship from our hearts, giving the praise. He's worthy of amen. Thank you, Lord. Come on, you sing out. This one thing I'm asking, one thing I'm needing, a moment that's passing is now what I'm seeking. Like it's the air I'm breathing, I want your presence, feet on the earth, heart full of heaven's zeal, feel Father, we cannot get enough of you this morning, Jesus. And God, we want more of you this morning, Father. So God, we come to worship, Lord. Rejoice in who you are. Celebrate your wonderful name, God. And God, give you all the praise you're worthy of this morning. And Father, we decide right now, Lord, despite the week we've had, Lord, good or bad, we choose to worship you this morning, Jesus. We choose to give you praise this morning, God. Father, because you're so worthy, God. You've done so much for us, Father. We're so grateful, God. Come on, can we just thank him this morning before we even start this next song? Just put praise on your lips. Give him glory this morning. Father, we worship you, Lord, for who you are, God. Father, you've been so good to us, Lord. So good, Father. We love you. We love you, God. We praise your name. Glory, Lord. How great the chasm that lay 
way between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished and the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope Can we sing? The cross has spoken. I'm forgiven.
come rejoice this morning, church. You are my hope, Lord. We give you praise for all that you've done, Lord. We worship you, Jesus, for you overcame it all. You overcame. Death no has no hold on you, Lord. You victorious. Thank you, Jesus. Sing hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Come on, you lift it up. Death has lost its grip for me. For you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Oh God, you are, you're my living hope. God, you are my hope. You are my hope, Lord. All my hopes in you, Father. You're my foundation, Lord. It starts and ends with you, Jesus. You're my everything. Seated 
with you, Lord. And when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority Jesus has given me When I open up my mouth Miracles are breaking out I have the authority Jesus has given me God's going to break some walls down right now. Jesus, Jesus, right now I ask God you to come. God, break some walls. Heal some people, Lord, I pray. God, restore people right now in the name of Jesus. Church, I really feel like God wants to do something in your life. If you're comfortable this morning, please lift your hands and you cry out to God this morning. He's here among us right now. the line of this song, I am who you say I am. That line just resonated with me this morning. I am who you say I am. Not who I think I am, not who the enemy tries to tell me that I am. I am who you say I am. I am a children, children of God. We are children of God this morning. And we have victory through Christ church. Victory this morning. Amen. So this morning when we sing like this, we lift our voice and we shout. These walls come crashing down. Miracles break out among us because that's the God that we serve. That's who He is. And we have the victory in Him, the authority in Him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Come on, let's sing this again with our faith a little higher. Come on. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth miracles are breaking out I have the authority yes we do oh, Jesus has given me Oh, 
praise this morning church thank you Lord aren't you glad that Jesus is our champion amen I was in a gathering about a week and a half ago and a man in our church named John who I've known for many years and John could he was very difficult to walk his knees were just so messed up and he said to me pastor we haven't told you yet he said but but there's some men in this church that prayed for me he said watch this and he got off his chair and he began to walk as good as I'm walking now how many people know that Jesus our champion can heal the sick amen Jesus our champion can set captives free Jesus our champion can do what no one can do I want you to lift your hands to the heavens father we declare that this house shall be a house of miracles we pray God that sick bodies will be healed this morning we pray that captives would be set free this morning we pray God that 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 clouds of depression would break and lift in the name of Jesus this morning we pray miracle in finances miracles in families we pray miracles all across this auditorium today I pray God that the windows of heaven would open up I pray, God, as we have communion in just a moment, that you would just inhabit this place. You are our champion. And we give you the glory, the honor, the praise, the thanks in Jesus' name. Nobody whispered. Everybody shouted amen. Come on, everybody shouted amen. Amen. Put your hands together and celebrate our Lord God Almighty. He is. He is our champion. He is our champion. He is our champion. We'll take a seat in God's presence. We are going to celebrate communion together. And moms and dads, this is our Unite service. And we're asking you to take parental responsibility with your children for communion. I actually hope that you allow them to participate. This is so good and so honoring and uh, so symbolic. And so some friends are going to come forward. Come forward now with the emblems. And you're going to receive a small cup of juice, a small wafer. Hold on to it. And we will partake together in a few moments. Sometimes we like to stand when we worship, but just to make it easier, could you remain seated until the tray has gone all the way across your aisle? And then if you wish to stand, you're welcome to. Let's continue to worship as the emblems are being distributed.
for all my sin Your body crucified To make me whole again And I will recall the cup Poured out in sacrifice to trade the sinner's end for your new covenant. Hallelujah. I live my life in remembrance.
standing could you stand with us this morning today we celebrate what Jesus did on a cross for us some 2,000 years ago Jesus one day in an upper room with his disciples took bread gave thanks broken and said this is my body do this in remembrance of me he took the cup from the fruit of the vine he said this represents my blood do this also in remembrance of me Today, as we hold on to the little wafer and the little cup of juice, may we never forget the price that Jesus paid, the debt that he paid. You could never pay it, but he paid it on your behalf, my behalf. He took upon himself the sins of all mankind. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus went to a cross for me. Did you know that if you were the only one on planet Earth, Jesus still would have went to the cross for you because he loves you. He loves you. So could we pause? Could we give thanks? Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you thanks. We thank you, God the Father, for sending your Son. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. We thank you, God the Father, for raising Jesus to life. We thank you, Jesus, that you live forevermore. Hallelujah. And I pray on this communion Sunday, we would never forget what you did for us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you hold the wafer up? This represents his body. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Let's partake of the wafer that represents his body. Would you hold the cup up? This contains the juice. This represents his blood. Blood represents life. Jesus gave his life for us. He died so that we can live. Amen. God raised him from the grave. The grave is empty. Amen. He's so good. He's so good. Would you drink this cup of juice in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us? You can put that cup down. Could you put your hands together and celebrate our Lord? He is so good. He's so good. Amen. How many people are glad that He is good? Just before we transition, lift your hands and focus on the goodness of God. You've been so, so good to me. Oh, to think. Don't you think? beautiful day it is and I want to give a shout out welcome to our online church people in our city our nation and globally around the world that have joined in to 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 our service today we are so glad that you've chosen to be here and I'm so glad that you have chosen to be here this morning it's fun to honor isn't it and we love Pastor Joe and we are so grateful for him everybody say the word today we are going to begin a nine-part sermon series looking at the fruit of the Spirit 
And we're calling this sermon series Cultivate. And we really believe that God wants to cultivate, God wants to develop, God wants to mature these fruit of the Spirit in our life. And so we thought we would take one Sunday for nine Sundays to delve into this amazing theme. So I want to invite you to pull out your sermon notes. They are on the back of your bulletin. Or you can pull it up on your handheld device. And we're going to talk to you for nine Sundays about Cultivate. And our theme text is found in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23. Paul is writing to a church in Galatia, and he said, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such there is no law. And so we really believe that God wants these fruit to be matured, to be developed, to be lived out in our life. So I want to start this sermon series with an introduction. I want to offer to you, if I could, I want to give to you seven preliminary observations just to kind of set the stage, set the tone. And I want to encourage you to take notes, and I believe that these thoughts could be of help and encouragement to everyone in this place, regardless of our age and regardless of where we are in our spiritual journey. Preliminary observation number one, and I think we need to have this very clear in our hearts, we cannot, we cannot create these fruit on our own. Why can we not create these fruit on our own? Because they are a spirit work. They are the fruit of the spirit. Only the spirit can create these fruit, mature this fruit, cultivate this fruit in our life. You can't do this on your own. You could fake it, but you'll get caught. And now I've got two uh, baskets here of fruit. Now the interesting thing is some of this fruit is fake and some of this fruit is real. Can you tell the difference? Do you know which one is real? Which one is fake? Which is real? Is this real? If this is real, lift up your right hand. Is this real? Is this real? Is this real? How many people have no clue? Lift up your hand. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try one of these right here. Let's just see if this is real. It won't even come off. Mm. Sometimes you've got to get up real close to people to discover if the fruit is real or if the fruit is fake. Now, I got a banana here, and we just want to peel back in our life and see. This is my sermon. I can do what I want. Mmm. Mmm. One more, one second here. <laughs> you got to peel back in your life to see what is really there. But only the Spirit can create this fruit. So let me read to you some verses. Let me read verse 13 down to verse 21. Paul writing to the church of Galatia, you, my brothers and sisters, he's writing to the believers in the church of Galatia. We're called to be free. How many people are glad that we're called to be free? Anybody glad that we're called to be free? If you're glad that we're called to be free, come on, give a little clap offering of praise to the Lord. Isn't it great? You're called. You're called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. I mean, you've got the battle between your fleshly nature and your spirit nature. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul is saying that the fruit of the Spirit is to affect how we relate to one another. Look at verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Paul is saying in the church of Galatia, there was dissension, there was division. And so he's calling them to see the fruit of the spirit matured in their life. Look at verse 16. So I say, walk by the spirit or live your life by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they're in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want there's a battle in you between your flesh and the spirit verse 18 but if you're led by the spirit you're not under the law verse 19 the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality impurity debauchery idolatry witchcraft hatred discord jealousy fits of rage selfish ambition dissension factions verse 21 envy drunkenness orgies and the like i warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Church, the first thing, understand, only the Spirit can create this in your life. You can't create it. You can fake it, but you can't create it. You want to have the real fruit of the Spirit. The second thing, number two, 
the fruit of the Spirit, it actually is a package deal. And I have people say to me, well, you know, love is my thing, but not joy. Faithfulness is their thing, but, but not self-control. It's not my thing. And we kind of treat it like we can pick or choose. But the fact is, you cannot pick or choose the fruit. God wants all of them to be fully matured in your life. It is a package deal. Then there's number three. The focus is on our godly character. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, and I heard so much teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. Now, this series is not focusing on the gifts of the Spirit. This series is focusing on the grace of the Spirit. And the challenge that I discovered as a follower of Jesus Christ is that some of us have elevated the gifts of the Spirit, that when the gift of the Spirit is exemplified in your life, it's symbolic of your spiritual maturity. But the truth is, the gifts of the Spirit are a gift. Even in the Old Testament, God used a donkey. Interesting. And the gifts of the Spirit are gifts, but your true spiritual maturity is demonstrated through the fruit of the Spirit. And so number three, I want you to hear today that the focus is always on godly character. Then there's number four. The fruit must be displayed individually, and not just individually, collectively. I mean, God wants these fruit to be displayed in my life and in your life, but here it is. God wants the fruit of the Spirit to be displayed in the church's life. He wants this church to be a church of love. Somebody say amen to that. He wants this to be a church of self-control, a church of joy. He wants them to be exemplified in our church corporately and in our lives individually. Then there's number five. Not all fruit ripens at the same time. And so when I hold on to these real grapes, and these are the real grapes, I mean, some of them look a little more ripe than the others. And if I take one of these here, and I won't eat this one, it's, it's, it looks bad. It's all dark. It's probably terrible tasting. I don't think I want that grape. I'm going to put it back. But if I pull this one off here, it looks so good. Oh. Anybody, anybody want a grape? Anybody want a grape? Pastor Kyle, you ready? Anybody want a grape? Don't worry, I washed them. <laughs> they ripen at different times. They just do. And in your life, you might have a little more joy and a little less love. But God wants all of the fruit of the Spirit to fully ripen and fully mature in your life. It's a package deal. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And not all fruit ripens at the same time. Then there's number six. The fruit of the Spirit, I honestly believe, should be the result of living a normal Christian life. I really believe that it should not be the exception. It needs to be the norm. It's not like, wow, that church is so loving. They're, they're really uniquely different. I think God wants every church to be a church of love. Every church to be a church of joy. Every church to see all of these fruit fully matured in our lives individually and collectively. It's meant to be the normal part of the Christian life. But then there's number seven. The seventh thing I want to leave you with in this introduction is bearing fruit in our life. It just doesn't happen automatically. I mean, it just doesn't happen automatically. How do you get the fruit of the Spirit to be lived out in your life? It's surrendering your life fully to God. God, I give you my mind. I give you my will. I give you my desires. I give myself over to you. I want to live in the Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want my life to be controlled by the Spirit. I don't want my life to be controlled by Mark. I want my life to be controlled by the Spirit. I don't want to live my life in the flesh. I want to live my life in the Spirit. I want us as a church to keep in step with the Spirit. Here's my prayer, that all of these fruit collectively together would be fully matured in everyone's life. I'll tell you, friends, what a difference we will make in the city of Ottawa when all the fruit of the Spirit is fully matured and displayed in our life. Now think about it. Who wants to go to a church that has no love? Who wants to go to a church that has no joy? 
Who wants to go to a church where everybody's frowning and depressed and hates coming? Who wants to go to a church that's loaded with love and filled with joy? That's a church that's attractive to a city. And so I really believe that God, by His Spirit, over these nine Sundays, is going to do an amazing work in my life and in your life, and He's going to raise the bar and cause us to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. So let's review it. Number one, we can't create it. It's a package deal. It focuses on godly character. Number four, it's displayed individually and collectively. Five, it doesn't all ripen at the same time. Six, it's meant to be a normal part of the Christian life. And seven, bearing fruit in our life is not automatic. So today we're going to camp for just a couple of moments on the first fruit of the Spirit, love. Everybody say love. Love. All you need is love. I know you got a song going on in your head. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so I want you to get your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to read this morning a landmark passage of Scripture, a classic passage of Scripture. I mean, the bell ringer passage of Scripture that Paul was writing to a church in Corinth. Now, it's interesting. The church in Corinth was arguing and debating and saying, I'm more spiritual than you because I used this gift of the Spirit. And they were arguing, devouring each other, and debating each other. And so in the middle of the teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, Paul gives a teaching on love. It's an amazing passage of Scripture. You've heard it read at weddings. And I believe that God wants to speak to us through this passage of Scripture. Now, if you look at your notes, I call number two the agape love chapter. Did you know that there's actually six Greek words that were used for love in those days? Let me give you a couple of them. One was philios. You ever heard of Philadelphia? And philios means brotherly love. And then there's another word, eros, E-R-O-S, which is about the sensual love. And here's Paul writing to a church. And here we have the day where there was no Greek words in the language of that day to describe the love that Paul wanted to speak about. Because Paul wanted to talk about a love that flows from God because doesn't the Bible say God is love? Isn't that right? If you want to know what love is, God is love. If you want to know what love is, God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus for you. And as I said in communion, if you were the only one on planet earth, Jesus still would have came to earth for you. God is the example. He is the definition of love. And so Paul is trying to write to a church and he's trying to find a word that, that speaks of a, a, a loyal love, a committed love, a committed love to imperfect people. And so they came up with this word agape, which means a, a committed, loyal love to an imperfect person that says, I'm going to love you no matter what. There's nothing you can do to change that love. Paul was writing to another church and he talked about love and how high it is, how deep it is, how wide it is, and how nothing can separate us from the love of God. Anybody this morning glad that the love of God is marvelous? Anybody glad this morning that the love of God is great? Anybody this morning glad that God loves you unconditionally? You see, it's not the word eros here. It's not the word philios. It's the word agape. There's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. He may not love what you do, but he loves you so much. He loves you so much that when you mess up, he pursues you. When you make a mistake, he forgives you when you bring it to the cross. He loves you so much, he will go to great lengths to get you back in right relationship. Oh, the love of God. I could camp on that word all morning. I don't know about you, but I am overwhelmed that God is love. He's love. And so I want to talk to you for a few moments about this fruit of the Spirit, love. And if you look at your notes number two, I want to give you just two thoughts. And the first thought I want to give to you, number one, is the, the preeminence of love. The preeminence of love. 
And I want to read to you verse 1 down to verse 3 as, 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 as Paul is trying to teach the Corinthian church that the love is preeminent. And, and he gives some interesting comparisons on the preeminence of love. Let, let me read verse 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of man or of angels, but I don't have love, agape, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. When I was growing up, there was a program on TV called The Gong Show. Anybody ever see The Gong Show? I'm going way, way back. Now, now, you may not know this, but in the day when Paul wrote this, there were pagan gods and pagan temples. And I'm told outside the pagan temples was a great big cymbal or a gong. And if you were worshiping that pagan false god, you know what you do? You go to the temple and you get this great big thing and you would hit the symbol. And the reason why you would hit the symbol is you were trying to wake up your God so that your God would hear your prayers. Isn't that ridiculous? How many people know we don't have to wake God up? How many people know God? God is, God is awake at all. He doesn't slumber or sleep. How many people know that? Now, in that culture, this is what Paul was talking about. He's going, come on, man. You got these pagan temples, these pagan gods, and these people go to their temple, pagan temple, and they hit the gong like they're trying to wake up their God who doesn't even exist. And so Paul said, you speak in tongues. That's marvelous. But you don't have love. You're as ridiculous as the people hitting the gongs, the symbols outside of the temples. Love is everything. I could get up here this morning and preach maybe a half decent message, but if I don't have love, the message doesn't mean anything. You've got to coat it and cover it and clothe it and bathe it and saturate it. Are you getting in this morning, church? It's got to be soaked in love because love is preeminent. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy... And I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. Wow, I can prophesy. Wow, I've got all the knowledge in the world. I know everything about science. I know everything about psychology. I know everything about calculus. I know everything about medicine. I've got all the knowledge in the world. Paul says, you can have the gift of prophecy. You can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and have faith that can move mountains. But if you don't have love, I'm nothing. Look at verse 3. If I give all I possess to the poor, I'm generous. And I give my, over my body to hardship, sacrifice, so that I may boast. But if I don't have love, I gain nothing. Church, love is everything. Love must be involved in everything we do, everything we say. Agape unconditional love. A love that says, I'm with you no matter what. A love that says, I've got your back. A love that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. A love that says, I'm with you in the journey. The first thing Paul teaches us is the preeminence of love. But then there's number two. And I want you to write this in your notes. Here's the practice. This is the practice of love. This is the living out of your love. I have people come to me all the time and go, but I don't feel love. I'm not in love with my spouse anymore. I don't feel love. I dare you to pull Evelyn aside this morning and ask her if she's ever had a moment in our marriage where she didn't feel love to me. I mean, has your spouse ever said to you, I love you, but right now I'm not sure that I like you. You've been there. You've been there. I mean, if love is just a feeling, we all in trouble. Am I right? I mean, love is more than a feeling. It's a covenant. It's I'm with you no matter what. 
I mean, there was actually a Greek word that was used in those days that was a natural thing of love that talked about the feely love. And when you don't feel it, you just forget it. But God says, no, love is not based on feeling. I mean, think about it for a moment. Can you imagine if God looked down at you and said, I'm a little tired of you. I don't want to ever see you again. How many people are glad that's not who our God is? How many people are glad that our God, our God, our God is for us, not against us? How many people are glad that our God loves us so unconditionally? How many people are glad that the love of God is matchless and in? Come on, Woodville. How many people are glad that the love of God is matchless and infinite? It's more than a feeling. Here's what I've learned. Feelings follow actions. Actions don't follow feelings. Feelings follow actions. You want to fall and grow in love again with your spouse? Live out love actions and watch the feeling follow. So I want want to read to you some amazing verses, verse 4 down to verse 7, where Paul gets so practical about love. Here it is. Look at verse 4. Love is patient. Can I ask you a question? Anybody got the patient thing fully figured out? Anybody, anybody perfect at patience? Lift up your hand. We want to honor you today. You're amazing. <laughs> Nobody's got the patient thing fully figured out. I, I know this. If you ever pray for patience, God will put you through something to teach you patience. He said love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy It does not boast, and it's not proud. Let let those words soak in. It's patient. Okay, God, I want to grow on that one. It's kind. Okay. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. Look at verse 5. It does not dishonor others. God is all about honor. It's not self-seeking. I mean, self-seeking is that narcissistic mentality that's all about me. It's all, of, look at me, watch me, focus on me. But, but, but Paul says love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no records of wrongs. How many people know this is a lot of stuff right here? Man, this is deep stuff. And then he says in verse 7, it or verse 6, sorry. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. And then in verse 7, it always protects. I want to pause there. Because Paul picks up an ancient Hebrew word for love that teaches us that love means to cover. It means to protect It's like putting a blanket over a cold person, putting a coat on someone, covering them, protecting them. And he says, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. There are 15 things that Paul mentions here about living out love. And I'm just going to be honest with you. On your own, you're going to fail miserably in these areas. But with the spirit of the living God, you can succeed in God's realm. Somebody say amen. I, 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 here's what I'm praying for me. May your spirit cultivate these areas of love in my life. God, I can't do it on my own. May your spirit make me more, more patient. May your spirit make me more kind. May your spirit help me not to get angry. May your spirit help me to walk in forgiveness. May your spirit help me to always protect, to always hope, and to always trust, and to always persevere, and to never give up. You can't do it in your own strength, but with the help of Holy Spirit, you can do it. Come on, give a clap offering of praise to the Lord God. So Paul talks to us in this great passage of Scripture about the preeminence of love and the practice of love. I want to take you to number three, and I want to take you to the application. This is where you're going to go, ouch, I wish he stopped at number two. 
I mean, right now, it's just been theory. Right now, it's just been textbook. Now it's going to become personal. So ushers, block the back doors. <laughs> Are you ready? I know you're not, but I'm going to go anyways. Number one, confess your lack of love. Now, I know the moment I said that, probably 50% of you just shut me out. Oh, I've got the love thing figured out. No, you don't. No, you don't. Confess. God, I, 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 you know, let's be honest. It's easy to say we love the world. It's easy to love people who you don't rub shoulders with daily. But it's tougher to love the people sometimes, can I just be honest, who are sitting right beside you right now. Sometimes it's hard to love the one that's closest to you. Sometimes it's hard to love the one that's different than you. Sometimes it's hard to love the person who is difficult. And it's definitely hard to love the one that irritates you. So let me be honest. Some of you, you need to confess that the love deal is a little low between you and your spouse. Some of you need to confess that the love deal is a little low between you and a sibling or you and a child or maybe you and a boss or maybe you and another congregant. Whom do you avoid is probably the one you need to grow in love towards. So we got to start by confessing it. Now I'm just going to be honest. I want to be the first to say I need God's help to grow more in the cultivation of love fully in my life. Is there someone you don't love because they don't theologically look at things the same way as you? Is there someone you don't love because they're that annoying neighbor that does not cut their lawn? I don't know the reason why you struggle, but the Bible teaches us that we're to love everybody. 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. So number one, confess your lack of love. Anybody willing to lift your hand up on this one? Anybody want to confess your lack of love? Come on, anybody? Anybody? Just feel free. All ten of you wonderful people. The rest of you are so spiritual giants. We honor you. We want to grow from you and learn from you because you've got the love thing all figured out. Confess. Number two, and we've kind of built on this, but let me say it again. Focus on God's love for you. I'm going to tell you and show you why at times we struggle with love to someone else is because we don't truly love ourselves. And sometimes the reason why we don't truly love ourselves is because we don't truly understand how much God loves us. If you want to love others the way God loves others, you need to understand that you need to love yourself and you can only love yourself when you truly understand how much God loves you. So I want everybody to get on their feet for a moment. Come on, everybody get on your feet for a moment. Little audience participation. I want you to put your arms like this as wide as you can. Come on, you can even hit the person beside you as wide as you can. Did you know that the love of God is even wider than the length of your arms going out? Now I want you to go like this. Did you know that the love of God is even higher and deeper than your arms can go out? How many, come on, you put your hands down. How, how many people know that the love of God is so wide, it's so deep, it's so powerful, it's so beautiful, it's so mighty? How many people this morning know that God really, 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 He loves you? He loved you before you were born. He loved, he loves, he loves, he loves, he loves you unconditionally. He loves you so much, I don't think I can find an earthly word to describe how much God loves me. I was a young minister, and it was the mid-80s. And I graduated from Bible college and, and I'm 22 years of age and, and I'm trying to walk through my insecurities and walk through the baggage of my upbringing and walk through different things in life. And I can remember the day I got rocked by how much God loves me. 
I was raised in a home where mom loved me and dad loved me, but I was raised in a home that my father could not verbally express his love to me. I never heard my father say, son, I love you. He could write it in a letter. We got married. He wrote me a seven-page letter. Son, I'm so proud of you. I love you. But he could never say the words to me. I love you. And so I discovered that I was starving, starving for fatherly male roles, more role models to look at me and say, I love you. And there's some of you here today, you're going, I can relate to that story. And that's the reason why I'm always saying to my kids, I love you. Have I told you today? I love you. I'll call them on the phone. I love you. I'll text them. I love you. You can't tell someone too much that you love them. You cannot OD on love. I'm here to say to you that God loves you so much. I was in my early 20s, and I can remember in my office in the first church where I was pastoring, and, and I was having my devotional time, and I got, I got showered with the love of God. I, got, I felt like God was reaching down just for me. I felt like I was the only person on planet Earth. I felt like He was wrapping His arms around me. And I'll tell you, church, I'm overwhelmed again today with how much my God loves me unconditionally. I'll tell you, friends, you will be able to love others when you can love yourself for who you are in Christ and begin to realize oh how he loves you so I want you right now to give him thanks because he loves you come on give him thanks because he loves you he loves you so before you're seated let me get real practical sing songs about the love of God Okay, you can be seated. I said before you were seated, and half of you sat down. You may be seated. Google the word love on a Bible app and read all the verses in the Bible about the love of God. Number one, confess your lack of love. Number two, focus on God's love. Now, now number three, this one's going to hurt. Identify someone that is hard for you to love. Can you do that? Can you do that? Some of you are thinking, Mark, I need more paper. <laughs> Who is? Some of you are looking at me right now going, but you don't know what they did. I could never love that person. You see, you're not responsible for their actions, but you are responsible for your actions. Love doesn't mean that you have to be in, in this ongoing, perfect world of talking and communicating. You sometimes have to put boundaries. Love just means that you're going to live out what we read from 1 Corinthians, and it includes keeping no records of wrong. I'll tell you, some of you today, you're struggling in the love thing because you've got unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, and somehow you think that forgiveness means that you've got to be total reconciled to that person. Church, you were called to total forgiveness not total reconciliation total reconciliation might happen might but total forgiveness is mandatory and if you don't forgive you will walk in a prison of hurt and resentment so number three identify someone that is hard for you to love then there's number four this is real practical treat treat that person Treat that person in a loving way. And here's, here's what I do when I think of someone that I'm struggling to love. I reread those verses from 1 Corinthians 13, and there's 15 practical ways that you can show love. And I just say, Holy Spirit, cultivate more kindness in my heart towards them. Holy Spirit, cultivate more patience in my heart towards that person and then I start asking God how I can show love so that the feeling will follow my actions and I've learned when I start to live it out the Spirit of God begins to do a greater work in my life and so I, I want to challenge you I want to challenge you to treat that person in a loving way and then there's number five this is the last one 
and it's very scripturally based, and it's, it's a secret of my life. Stay close to Jesus. John 15, verse 4 says, remain in me. Jesus said this, and I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If we went out to an apple orchard and we cut the branch off of an apple tree and we took it home, those apples will not survive unless the branch is tapped into the vine. Here's what I've learned. When I stay close to Jesus, when I stay close to Jesus, Holy Spirit begins to cultivate more love in my life. And I've got a picture right now in my mind of God ripening love in my life and in your life. And I I have a picture of God saying to this church, and to the greater church in Ottawa, that if we want to reach this city, we got to be a church that is soaking in love. A church that says, come with your imperfections and meet the perfect Savior. A church that never says, clean up before you show up. Are you with me today, friends? Church is not meant to be a place for the perfect. We don't say, clean up before you show up. We say, show up and let the Holy Spirit do His work inside you. We want to be a church that says, I love you no matter what. I accept you for who you are, but I love you so much, I'm going to let the truth of God's word speak to you. Somebody, 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 somebody give a little witness in the house today. And so in this introductory message, I want to challenge you under the application to confess, number one, any level of lack of love in your life. Number two, to focus on the love of God. Number three, this is the tough one. Who is it that you need to identify that you know that you struggle in love towards them? Number four, God, help me to treat that person in a loving way. Help me, God, to live out the teaching from 1 Corinthians 13. And then number five, I'm just going to stay close to Jesus. And I'm going to let God ripen love in my heart so that I am just like these juicy grapes oozing. Oh. Oh. Can I have just one more? Mmm. so good that grape was perfect that grape was ripe it tasted so good I want this church to be so ripe with love that they would know we are Christians by our love that love would be oozing from us and flowing from us that we would be saturated in the love of God because the love of God in our lives is attractive to people. How many of you people this morning want God's love to shine through your life at all times? I do. Father God, I want to say thank you for every single person in this first morning service. And God, as we've offered the introductory message, we've been reminded today that we can't cultivate these fruit on our own. We can fake it, but we can't cultivate it. God, we've been reminded this morning that that it's a package deal, and we're just starting with love, and God, we're, we're just focusing on love today, and I'm praying, God, that that agape love would just be cultivated and fully ripened in my life and in the life of everyone in this auditorium today. I pray in the name of the Lord that we would see how preeminent that love is and how practical that love is, and I pray, God, that you would help everyone in this auditorium to live out that love to you. I pray, God, that we would grow in it. I pray that we would confess when we're lacking in it. 
And I pray that we would identify the one or the ones that we need to, we need to live this out towards. I pray in the name of Jesus that love would grow deeper individually and collectively in this church. And now, God, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Every head is bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. And there's two things that I want to close this service with. And the first thing is our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. As we've talked about the love of God this morning, perhaps you're sitting here today. And if today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity, that you don't know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven. And my question to you this morning is, do you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven? God loves you. And you're sitting here today and you're like, I, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I, I think I'm going to heaven, but I don't know. I, I want to say to you that you can walk out of this auditorium knowing that you're going to heaven. God loves you so much, he sent his son Jesus. Jesus came and died for your sins. In just a couple of moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. But allow me to ask the question again. You're sitting here today. Do you know that you're ready for heaven? If today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity, do you know that you're going to heaven? If you can't answer that question with a definite yes, but you want to be ready for heaven, you want to receive Christ in your life, you want to be led in a prayer to, to make your peace with God, I, I'm not going to belabor this moment, but every Sunday we give this opportunity and you'd like to receive Christ in your life and you want to be led in this prayer, I'm going to count to three and if you'd like to be led in this prayer, I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. That's you. you. Lift your hand as high as you can. Yeah. You put your hands down. If you lift your hand, I want to lead you in this prayer. And we're going to join you as you pray. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come, into my life. come into my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Me of my sins. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. I make my peace with you today. I receive you in my life. I say yes to Jesus. Today, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you put your hands together and celebrate salvation? Never get tired of people coming to Christ. I want you to stand to your feet. And if you pray that prayer today and ask Christ in your life in a couple of moments when this service comes to a close, I want you to go in the lobby to the wall that says follow. And we got some friendly people there. We got a Bible for you. It's free. We got a little booklet for you. It's free. And we want to help you in your new faith journey. If you don't attend a Bible-believing, life-giving church, how many at Woodville would be honored if they joined us in the journey? I'd be the first to say, yeah, come and join us in the journey. And if you're our guest, I want to say again, thank you for coming. I hope you go to the guest lounge. we got a coffee card for Tim Hortons or Starbucks or McDonald's for you. And on your behalf, we're going to make a donation to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And if this is your church, get into a connect group. Go to the connect wall. If you want to lead one, host one, attend one, you go there. Serving, come this Wednesday night. We're going to help you find your place of serving. Well, I said there's another thing I, I want to share. And, I just felt the Lord say to me on this communion Sunday, I gave that story of this man named John who could, couldn't walk well, and people prayed for him, and now he walks amazingly well. We want this place to be a place of miracles. And here's what we're going to do. Pastor Brad, you're going to lead us in a song, and if you need healing in your body or healing in your emotions or healing in your marriage, you need a miracle, whatever it is, financial, emotional, physical, whatever it is, we believe that Jesus can do the impossible. Are you with me today, friends? Do we believe Jesus can do the impossible? Amen. Do we believe Jesus can do the impossible? Amen. And I, I want to ask if the pastors and the board and the prayer team would come. And as Pastor Brad leads us, if you need a miracle, I want you to come. We want to pray for you. We want to believe that you would receive your miracle today. So if you'd like prayer, come on forward. And board and pastors and altar workers, come on forward. And pastor, if you would lead us. There's no shadow you will light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. 
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Come on, you sing no shadow. There's no shadow you won't going to lead us in prayer and after I pray this altar is going to remain open and we're going to pray for each one of you that have come to the front and after I pray if you want to stay in worship for a few more moments you're welcome to if you need to go feel free to go with God's blessing God thank you for this our time this morning I pray for everyone that has come and is standing at the front that needs a miracle that you oh God would be the miracle worker in this place today I pray, God, for each one that needs to go. May they go with your blessing, your grace. We thank you, God, for our time this morning. To God be the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you.